Dom is the director of NIO and is based in Norwich, is an ELT expert, a teacher trainer, and is going to be talking to us today about how to enhance our professional development in this new normal that we're living in right now. So over to you, Tom, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Federica, and hello, everybody. Literally around the world, uh, as Federica has said, it's a, an honor, a pleasure to, to be here with you. And, and my thanks go to um, to Mike and Federica and all the team at Macmillan Education for, for inviting me to be here. And, and um, more importantly, for the, the whole season, the series of webinars that they've put on in the last couple of months, which I'm sure you'll have uh, benefited from and can still benefit from in the recording. So a real uh, great support for, for teachers everywhere uh, in this series. And I'm, I'm honored to be um, invited to, to share my thoughts in this in this last of the series. Um, and we're going to be talking about professional development, professional development opportunities and, and how things might change and might have changed in um, what's being termed the new normal or a new normal. And this obviously um, is a topic which is on everybody's uh, minds in the forefront of people's thoughts. What is this new normal going to be like? And um, only a fool would step in and say they know exactly how the, the world is going to, to rebalance and resettle uh, as we emerge from this pandemic. Um, uh, and how education is going to be impacted and what the future of education is going to be like. And of course, there's going to be major differences between contexts, within context. There's going to be different decisions that are made, um, different political decisions which are made around the world about uh, regulations and social distancing and how that impacts our face-to-face -face bricks and mortar educational institutions um, re opening and, and uh, redefining the way they work with students in a face-to-face -face setting. But I think there are some things that we can say, we can predict with, with relative confidence. Um, one of which is that uh, this enforced move and the way it's been adopted and adapted by so many fantastic teachers uh, around the world will allow us, I think, rather than force us to, to reconsider the relationship between online learning and face-to-face -face, um, interactions, content, the way in which uh, we, we present information, the way in which students work with that information and knowledge, and the way in which students use that information and knowledge with us and with each other uh, inside uh, an education setting and outside. And of course, We've, we've had over the many uh, of the, I guess, the last couple of decades, uh, progress in terms of uh, flipped classroom approaches, blended learning approaches, but not on a scale like this and not with the, um, the exposure to the, the opportunities that this has provided to such a huge number of students. So I think that in every institution, there'll be consideration given to what can we take as the best of the online experience, the best of the online opportunities, as we gradually move back to bringing face-to-face -to -face teaching to uh, a possibility again. So there will be a re-establishment of this um, relationship between what we do online and face-to-face, -face, and I think it will be different. Another big thing that's going to be a feature of, of the, the world of education as we knew it and as we come to know it will be uh, a bit of a change in the dynamic of the role of a teacher trainer and, and in-service professional development um, structures, I think. Many teacher trainers, directors of studies, senior teachers, academic managers, whatever you call them in your institution, have got to that position, have uh, risen to that role, have uh, achieved that status based on uh, extensive classroom experience built up over the last 10, 20, 30 years. They've, they've got that um, role there because they've taught different classes, they've taught in different contexts, they've taught different ages of students, they've, they've uh, uh, perhaps got qualifications based around their face-to-face -face classroom experience. But now, in this current situation, we're going to be faced with um, everybody starting as absolute beginners in terms of people who have taken on the online learning uh, responsibility in the last few months. Uh, of course, there have been online learning uh, practices uh, going on, but not on this scale and not perhaps with this reach. So we're in a situation where in a very short space of time, people are learning 
and getting experience which is going to supersede the experience in online learning of teacher trainers and directors of studies and so we need to reconsider whether that means that we look differently at how we do professional development sessions how we support teachers professional development and perhaps a much more bottom-up collaborative collegiate approach to professional development sharing ideas from teachers who've gained this experience in the last few years rather than a top-down teacher training knowledgeable expert and um, because that expertise uh, has been born and, and raised in a different teaching context i think another thing that will um, change is our access to professional development opportunities and I think the way that's already changing the the plethora of information and resources and, and webinars and web events and uh, courses which have been brought to our attention as we're, our focus has turned to online for education will still be with us and we'll have perhaps a bit more time over the coming months to explore all of those professional development opportunities which previously we may have um, undervalued or devalued in the face of face-to-face -face conferences, face-to-face -face training sessions, face-to-face -face, um, inset or, or pre-service training courses, I think will give more weight and give more value to the professional development opportunities which are available online. And a, dem a democratization, a leveling of that um, access as well, because many of those resources are, have been made free in the current context. Macmillan's One Stop English, for example, all of the amazing blog posts and resources on there. So we get a lot more access to this professional development. But we also need to remember that um, professional development isn't just about having access to new ideas and to opportunities and to uh, activities to try out. That exposure is crucial, of course, but actually professional development comes in the application of those ideas, the implementation of the, that uh, those new opportunities, activities in the classroom, and perhaps most importantly, in the reflection and the evaluation of the success or otherwise of the new ideas, the new activities, the new techniques, the new approaches. So it's not just about reading about something and feeling I've developed because of what I've read or watching something and feeling this. It's about taking this and putting it into practice, experimenting with it, trying it out, and then reflecting on it. It's a whole reflective practice dimension to professional development, which is really important uh, to keep in mind. So if we're thinking about professional development in the new normal, what do we need to be wary of? Well, um, a couple of things I think are important to uh, to focus on. And one thing is that we'll respond to change, respond to these opportunities, respond to these challenges differently as different individuals. And I love this analogy, which was uh, created by my um, colleague and former mentor at Nile, Rod Belitho. He comes up with this analogy based around how animals might react to change. For those of you who are quick fingered, in the chat box, what's that animal called on the top left of the screen? What's the name of that animal up there? Very good. So first one coming all through. Perfect. Hedgehog. Yes. So how does a hedgehog react to change, react to this potential threat, react to um, the, the danger that it perceives in the change to its environment? Well, you know, a hedgehog rolls up into a ball and puts out its spikes. It's very resistant to that change. Its first reaction is, is to throw out negativity, to throw out these spikes, to, to have a very uh, negative response to change. And we know teachers like that. We know some teachers who may be very nervous when it comes to change and react very um, in a very unwelcoming way to change and to give off these these uh, signals that don't come near me with your innovation. It's I was doing a fine before. I don't want to adapt to change. I don't embrace these opportunities. I see everything as a threat. So that's one way we need to be cautious that people may have this inbuilt fear of the 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 threat of um, the, the change rather than seeing opportunities within it or or areas in which they can develop for themselves. What about the second? animal in the middle at the top. It's a particular type of uh, bug. It's not a dragonfly. It's uh, it's similar. Um, it's actually called a, a mayfly. And the interesting thing about mayflies is that they live for such a short amount of time. Their whole lifespan is a maximum two days. So this is the kind of person who, when faced with change, huge amount of initial enthusiasm but it's very hard to, to maintain that motivation, to maintain that enthusiasm. So unless we catch that person and, and 
give them positive uh, messages and they have a good experience right in the first couple of uh, experiences of that new reality, then they're going to drop off enthusiasm very quickly and, and dismiss it as never worth uh, investing any time into it. For those people who, who come in with a burst of enthusiasm, we need to catch and capture that and think of ways to, to maintain that, otherwise it dies out very quickly. What about on the top right? Some of you are already there with a chameleon. Absolutely. What does a chameleon do in a new environment? How does a chameleon adapt to change? Well, it adapts on the surface level only, doesn't it? It may be showing signs of um, using new tools or, or embracing new platforms, uh, if we extend the analogy into teaching, but actually on the inside, it stayed the same. And all it wants to do is to deliver the content and to get the information across to the students and survive that hour in the online classroom. They're not really changing in terms of their pedagogy. They're not really um, making an adaptation to the opportunities. They're trying to force their old ways of teaching and learning into uh, a new reality. So be careful of people there. We might need to support in other ways and keep suggesting other uh, approaches they can take to make sure that adaptation and embracing of the new opportunities is uh, um, taken on board completely. What about the bottom left? An eagle, absolutely. Possibly a bald eagle, yeah. Absolutely. So what does an eagle do in, in the light of uh, a new environment? Well, the eagle is the, the animal that flies up to 10,000 feet and watches from a distance as change is happening and takes time to make a decision about whether they're going to fly down and get involved. Um, wants other people to, to take those first steps and see how they uh, succeed or fail, see what works for them. So they're much more reserved before they make their judgment and they may not go full wholeheartedly into a new opportunity. They may wait and see how it works for other people a bit. I'm, I'm sure you know people like that who like to step back and let other people rush ahead. It can be a very wise decision, can allow them to reflect on other people's practices, um, but that's also an individual difference, an individual reaction to change. And finally, the bottom right, it is a dinosaur, is anyone going to, uh, is it an oh, ankylosaurus, very good, someone's in there straight away with this, this arm and dinosaur, so anyway, it doesn't matter which dinosaur it is, this is the, the person when confronted with change says, do you know what, I'm going to be out of here in two years anyway, there's no way I'm changing my practice, I'm going to be retired or giving up the profession, so I'm not going to change, I'd rather be extinct than change. Um, so this, this, uh, these different attitudes to change, we need to remember that teachers are individuals and teachers we're supporting will approach change differently. And we may need to be sympathetic to some of those barriers, those resistances to change. As I said, all of these analogies brought from uh, my colleague at now, Rod Balaitho. Um, and we also need to remember that ch whilst change is individual, there are some predictable cycles over time. Now this, um, this graph uh, this chart on the uh, on the screen now has been around since the 1960s how people respond psychologically to big changes sometimes trauma or major changes in their life and that when something happens to us people will approach it differently as we discussed on the previous screen some people will be positive about it some people will be in despair about it um, but then there'll be this excitement or numbness rising into a honeymoon period where we're trying new things out and we're doing the best we can and then there's this kind of challenge this moment of a, a loss of confidence am i doing things right are my students actually learning am i i'm, I'm doing uh, the best i can but is it good enough um am i doing things right where's the best practice here and this uncertainty creeps in if you actually look at the time scale there that's kind of where many of us might be right now a couple of months into this brave new world of teaching online and, and asking our learners to engage online. But we can expect that this confidence, um, this hit to our confidence and this uncertainty about the success of our methods and our approaches is a natural part of the psychological transition process. And we need to be ready for this. And perhaps this is where we have the greatest need for professional development. This is where we need to reinforce those beliefs, reinforce those principles, uh, to find out from others, to test the waters, to find out what things work for other people, to find out what things work for our students, and to really take professional development seriously, to give us that boost that's called the, the reconstruction and recovery phase where we think it's not just good enough, it's good.
and I'm doing a good job and I'm using the, the resources and the platforms and the tools well and blending my online opportunities with my face-to-face -face opportunities as they re-emerge and I feel confident that what I'm doing is, is positive. Um, so we need to remember that teachers have individual differences, responses to change, and that professional development can support those but needs to be sensitive to those individual developments, and that perhaps professional development is a, is a useful boost at a particular point in a, in a transition uh, of teachers from something very new and very strange as they it becomes part of a, a new normality, a new reality, and that's where professional development needs to step in and give that support. Um, what is professional development at its heart then? For us at Nile, certainly uh, um, a phrase we like to use is that for professional development to be effective, we need to give teachers, we need to give people roots and wings. We need to give them the basic competences, the skills, the tools, the resources to do their job properly, to do their job effectively um, and to deliver uh, a, an authentic, effective learning experience for their learners. But then we also need to give them the opportunity and the autonomy and the, the inspiration to fly with that, to soar, to seek out new ideas, to implement new ideas, to go in uh, different directions that maybe are not right for everybody but they're building on a base that we've given them. Um, it reminds me of a, uh, a session at a, a conference I saw in, uh, in the Czech Republic a, a couple of years ago, uh, given by a lady called Dorothy Zemak. And she said, you need to be really careful and cautious of anybody who says it's a good thing to constantly get out of your comfort zone. It's not a good thing to be constantly out of your comfort zone. You wouldn't be happy if you went to your dentist and your dentist said, do you know what? I'm pretty much out of my comfort zone today, but let's see how we get on. And then brings the drill towards your mouth. As teachers, as professionals, what we really want to do is to extend our comfort zone, to bring into our comfort zone more and more things that we are comfortable and confident with. We don't want to be constantly out of our comfort zone. We want to be expanding our comfort zone to encompass more and more techniques that become part of our, uh, our approach and our skill set and our set of competences. So I think that's a really important point to make and, and be wary of someone who says you always need to be on the back, uh, on the front foot and never uh, consolidating your learning that you do. Um, so professional development needs to give the basic competences and to support people doing their job, but it also needs to give the autonomy and the inspiration to, to fly into new areas and to, to expand that comfort zone. What might it consist of then? Well, I looked at um, I looked at a session that I gave a couple of years ago, and I was thinking, okay, a couple of years ago, I was talking about professional development opportunities. Back when we'd not heard of coronavirus, and back when this pandemic was was um, in our distant future, and came up with some suggestions of what um, professional development might look like. So I decided to go back to them for this webinar and have a look at these opportunities and see whether any of them have taken a real hit, are really under threat from the way education might change and the way access to opportunities might change and the way professional development might change in the aftermath of, of this uh, crisis. Um, so looking through them, trying to decide whether these were only possible in a face-to-face -face staff room, classroom context, or whether they could be similarly opportunities that could be exploited online and in blended uh, mode as well. Coffee break tips is just that very simple idea of what you learn in the staff room from your colleagues, activities that worked well, handouts that really got students working well or, or produce really good processing of language or deeper thought or deeper engagement with the language, little ideas to try out, little warmers, little uh, things to, to experiment with, little uh, tips for the classroom. I personally, most of my um, teaching career, I lived off these tips. They were so useful, just picking up bits from the staff room. Do they still happen? Well, we may not be in physical staff rooms at the moment, but I know a lot of institutions are really taking uh, the time to, to find other uh, formats for this to still happen. At Nile, we have a, a Slack channel, which is a, um, a messaging system within a group, and we, we share ideas through there. And we also, um, we take it a little bit more formally and we have uh, these bring and share events to give each other ideas of activities that work. But just being able to pick up things from people within your within your school, within your network, that sharing can still be very much alive in a, um, in a more digital world. 
much professional development can be gained by reading or watching uh, and reflecting. And that critical reflection is crucial. Reading, thinking about applying something to your situation, whether that's the, the articles, the, the blog posts that are on One Stop English, whether that's through open access journals, whether that's through digital ebooks that you can get hold of, um, your own library of, of teaching methodology books that you've not had a chance to explore because uh, you haven't had the time. That activity of reading, reflecting can be very much a part of. Uh, of your professional development in a in a digital space as well. We need to remember that that reflection is crucial. Don't just let it wash over you. Really do think about um, what your uh, what the application and the implications of what you read might be for you. One thing that we really um, <clears throat> can benefit from in the face to face setting is peer observation groups. Inviting someone else to come into your classroom to watch when you're teaching and give them a role and a focus. I want you to come into my class and I want you to look specifically at this. And I want you to tell me what's happening, be a second pair of eyes in my classroom. I don't want you to be evaluative. I don't want you to pass judgment. I just want you to be a second pair of eyes or to come in and say, can you work out if you can see what's going wrong when I try and do this activity or what's, what's the interaction between these students? Give them a real focus. So inviting someone in and you going into someone else's classroom is a real feature of professional development. All my best activities have been begged, borrowed and stolen from, from colleagues in, in my previous teaching jobs. And can this still happen online? Well, I would say, arguably, even more so. It's quite hard in the physical classroom to set up a camera and the audio to capture somebody's lesson digitally to be able to watch it at leisure, watch it a second, a third time. But clicking the record button in a, in a live classroom is much, much easier. We may need permission from um, the students involved, but when we're using it for internal professional development purposes, there shouldn't be much argument with that. We're not relaying it live or, or publicly on the internet. Um, but the opportunity to go in and to have control over what kind of feedback you're gonna get is really powerful professional development. So if you can do that and you do get the opportunity to watch how other people observe, uh, how, watch how other people teach and what they do to manage their students and how they uh, maintain participation and engagement with their students. Really great way of picking up professional development ideas. Insert activities, that's slightly more formal, organized, in-service professional development that's happening um, possibly on a regular basis within an institution where every Friday, one teacher or one uh, teacher trainer or one senior teacher will bring a, a focus and conduct a, a workshop on that. Happens very commonly in a in a face-to-face -face environment. Very easy to see how that could be replicated in the online environment. We do it at Nile where someone leads a, leads a discussion, leads a debate on a topic where we have a, um, a particular focus and then we all uh, contribute that after the presentation phase. Very easy to see how that could be done in a one of these um, rooms, these live uh, meeting rooms that we've adopted and adapted for our teaching, let's not think of them only as teaching platforms, let's think of them as professional development spaces for peer-to-peer -peer sharing and uh, workshops for teachers as well. Taking a little bit more formal action research, going into your classroom, your new environment, whether that's fully online, uh, blended, flipped, or return to face-to-face -to -face teaching, can we get involved with some real um, systematic investigation of what's happening, maybe with a, a change we're implementing in our classroom or the particular problem, gather data around it, try and gather data from more than one perspective, reflect on that data, try something else and see how that, that cycle develops into uh, our professional practice, being enriched by some quite formalized research. And of course, we can do that in an online setting just as much as we can do it in a face-to-face -face setting. And the the world will be crying out for these uh, principled research projects, even if it's on the classroom investigation level, to explore and share best practice or, or possible pitfalls in practice from the world of online learning. Of course, external courses are there as a uh, professional development opportunity. Uh, courses like uh, Federica mentioned that we run at Nile, maybe courses leading to certification, qualifications, which are gonna be increasingly important uh, in a, um, a squeezed job market. Uh, maybe not all the private institutions will survive this, uh, this threat to, to the business. So it may be that you want to go that professional development route, but I think you've probably already found that so many of those opportunities exist online as 
face to face. So whether you are talking about a, a certificate like a, um, uh, an initial qualification, uh, like a, a CELTA or a Trinity uh, CERT TESOL, they're now fully online. The Delta has been online for a, a significant time, a diploma level course. MAs can be done fully online. So all those uh, professional development opportunities are still going to be accessible in a, in a more digital world. Mentoring new colleagues, certainly. A great way of professionally developing yourself is to share your experience and to think about how you'd explain your, your knowledge and your competences to someone new. And of course, anybody who's new coming into the profession, it's gonna take time for pre-service courses to develop, to adapt to this new reality. And as you've been adapting on your feet and thinking on your feet, to, to um, kind of change live as the situation has changed around you, that's a perfect opportunity to share that experience with someone else. And when you're mentoring someone, it really forces you to, to rethink your own beliefs and your principles and to, to be able to articulate and explain them in a useful way to somebody else. And that's great professional development for yourself and also professional pride in being able to bring on a new colleague, a new teacher to your institution or to the course you're teaching. Attending conferences. Perhaps traditionally more value given to going to face-to-face -face conferences. You do get that kind of socializing and networking atmosphere, which can be difficult to recreate online. But we'll see in the next six months more and more organizations moving to online conference offerings, trying to bring in um, the, the value of the, uh, the events they've had to postpone or cancel through online activities. So I think there's going to be a lot more online conferences coming down that will really give us the opportunity to to participate and develop professionally and to meet other like-minded colleagues and a real aspect of that which i'd encourage for anybody who's who feels they're ready for it is to present at a conference that's a great professional development activity to to put in the thinking to prepare your own presentation perhaps to present something that's your research or your context or your idea um, and to have that developmental opportunity that you can feel confident about sharing your own uh, learning, your own skills in front of others is a fantastic opportunity for professional development and also one that I think will be increasingly um, available in an online space uh, as different calls for papers get published as people move conferences online. Now, when I wrote this taking on a new course type suggestion tip back in 2018, I certainly wasn't thinking about uh, a new mode of delivery of your course, I was thinking, well, why don't you think about getting involved with a different age group or a different focus area or moving into English for academic purposes or taking on English for specific purposes course or working with a, um, uh, a, uh, a skills-based course where you've been more uh, focused on systems of grammar and vocabulary. But actually, um, there is a massive professional development going on across the world right now as everybody has taken on new course types being a new modality of delivery and those new course types are certainly going to be a part of our future whether that becomes more of a focus on how to blend effectively how to get the best of the um, the online world when re returning to face to face or whether many institutions continue with a significant online presence as we know many universities are going to do for the next year to come. Um, I think that new course type professional development is something that we're all doing, um, those of us who've, who've had to change from face-to-face -face teaching to online. Bring and share events, again, another peer uh, opportunity for professional development, having the confidence to stand up in front of your peers and show an activity, to share an activity, to get them to do an activity, to, to role play the activity with them, to use uh, experiential learning for them to see how the activity might work with their students. Fantastic professional development for both the participants and the, and the uh, presenter. We do that at Nile online now. We set up uh, sessions and we invite everyone to come in with an online learning activity which works in their context. We try them out as participants and we comment on them and reflect on them and say, oh, and wouldn't it be great if you added this to it? Or, and couldn't you do this with it as well? And those real rich discussions emerge out of putting yourself in the shoes of the learners while your colleagues, your peers are, are presenting an activity to you. And of course, webinar attendance. Don't need to talk to you about this. You're, you're here, you've probably been to other uh, webinars in the Macmillan series. Fantastic opportunity for, um, for exposure to uh, new ideas or to reinforce ideas you, you already have or to challenge beliefs that you have. But remember, it's not just about the, the passive engagement with it. 
try to engage cognitively and think, well, would this work in my context? Can I think of a way to work uh, work it for me? Uh, or is it something that I, want, I need to think on more and do a bit of reading around before I embrace it? So the point I'm making here is that all of these professional development opportunities, which I suggested as um, uh, largely face-to-face -face back based activities back in 2018 are still opportunities now and will continue to be opportunities for us to have access, to exposure to those professional development um, opportunities and challenges. But we need to go and seek them. We need to have the right to say no. And we also need to um, think about how we're going to not only be exposed to these opportunities, but to implement the ideas into them in them and to reflect on the effectiveness of those activities to make sure that professional development is, is a whole rather than just um, a, an idea that sits in our head. Um, so that's my part of the presentation, but this is a Q&A session. So um, I want you to think before you ask your question, we're all somewhere in this professional development journey. Um, where are you and how are you feeling about your professional development at the moment? Which figure? on the bridge do you identify with most? Um, are you feeling confident in your achievement? You're at the right hand end of the bridge. You've done something recently which has given you a load of pride. You feel you've achieved something. Maybe that's a qualification or mastering a new skill or, or successfully delivering a, a lesson that you hadn't thought possible three months ago. Do you feel you're somewhere in the middle? Not quite sure which way to go. Not sure if it's worth persevering. Not sure if you're um, really pointed in the right direction. Do you feel that at the minute you're quite restrained in your professional development, restricted by access to, to tools or resources or opportunities, or perhaps more importantly, that your students are restricted in their access to some of these uh, tools, platforms that they need? Um, do you feel you know, you've, got, you've got that resistance that we talked about in the animal analogies earlier, that you, you're not ready to, to start this, you don't feel comfortable with it at the minute? You know, which characters you identify? I think there's probably one in there for everybody. Do you know who I think the, the most um, perceptive person on this bridge is? Well, I think it's this guy that I've colored in red here. Uh, in the chat box, if you've got uh, uh, quick fingers, what do you think this guy is saying? The guy I've colored in red there about the professional development journey. Okay, maybe he's motivating, maybe he's uh, he's saying, I, I managed it, you can too. Maybe he's directing others, maybe he's laughing at the rest, you know, um, that's true. But maybe he's uh, he's giving encouraging comments. Yeah, that, that, yeah, many of you are saying that, that uh, you are, um, you're encouraging. Actually, I think this guy is saying something quite different to the things you're putting in there. I think he's saying, hey, guys, Hey everybody, over there, there's another bridge. And I think he's realized that actually, we're not talking about one bridge in our professional development journey and that we cross it and we can sit there with our arms folded, but there are over each horizon, there are more bridges to cross and we'll feel these different experiences and these different emotions in the professional development at each time we come to a new bridge. And, and that professional development is a continuous lifelong learning process and should be embraced as such. So, um, that's the thought that I'm going to leave you with. What are your thoughts to share with me? What questions do you have that you want me to uh, to, to respond to or to throw back out through the chat box um, uh, to your opinions? Let me invite Federica back in to, to um, manage the questions um, that you've been asking and you'll ask uh, in the next half hour. I can see Federica's video is slowly whirring as she remains. Federica or Mike, can you can you uh, still hear me?
I've got you now, Federica. Sorry, that's possibly my connection. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely question. <laughs> I, I, I always uh, feel slightly conscious when I when I use this uh, slide and this analogy that uh, I'm presenting a, a whole series of negative reactions to change rather than um, positive reactions to change. Um, and so uh, on previous occasions when I've used this with groups of teachers, I've thrown the, um, the responsibility over to them for an animal that adapts well to change or is a good uh, symbolism or metaphor for adapting well to change. Uh, you can put yours in the uh, the uh, comments box. Dolphin's one that does come up uh, occasionally, that kind of adapting to uh, and the, the liveness of moving the body. I'll tell you the funniest one I heard, um, which was uh, that the, the animal which is best, uh, best suited to, uh, to adapting to online learning and technology is a spider. Why, why is spider? Why is a spider good at particularly online learning? And they came back and said, "Well, because a spider is always on the web." So um, that that was their offering, uh, and you can pop yours in the uh, in the uh, comments box. I, I do like that idea of you know gliding through uh, and the water flowing over you, not being impeded by this new context. So, yeah, I like the the dolphin analogy. Uh, very well. I also quite like the, although it's not a pretty image, I quite like the idea of the dung beetle, you know, the, the persistence, the c continued persistence to achieve a goal and to, to, to move the, the ball uphill that you've probably seen from nature documentaries. I think there's a lot of persistence needed in, in professional development sometimes. Thank you. That's really, um, that's really interesting to think about, actually. Uh, we also got a question from our Facebook live streaming from Silvania asking, what would you suggest us to read to motivate, to motivate us? And I think it also relates to another question that we got asking, um, what would you do to motivate people that are not so motivated uh, and that you have to work with if you want to uh, develop, but these people don't want to and you still have to work with them? Yeah, great. Um, okay, so, so we've talked a little bit in this session about how um, motivation and response to change are quite individual characteristics. And I think it's important that um, people are given the space to make a principled decision and to defend that decision about whether a particular professional development opportunity is right for them at that particular moment. Uh, I think that professional development can be very rewarding, but it can also be quite um, intense. It can be quite a lot of pressure. It can demand time. It can demand energy. It can demand other resources. And I get a little bit nervous when I see institutions which have kind of compulsory professional development, um, which is you must complete X number of activities of professional development every year, or you lose your job, or you don't get your salary increase. I think that teachers have a right to say no to professional development. There's too much going on in my personal life. I'm just trying to deal with everything that's going on around me. It's not the right time for me at the moment. And to a certain extent, we have to, um, to acknowledge that. We also have to acknowledge the fact that innovation without consolidation is pointless. There's no point constantly trying to do a new thing. We've got to let things become embedded in our practice if they're successful, rather than constantly striving to do something different, to do something new. So I'd hold on to that idea of if you give teachers, um, treat them individually, try to find out with them what their resistance is. Is it related to one of those aspects that they're, uh, you know, they just don't feel they have the time to commit at the moment? Or is it because they've got a, uh, another barrier to, to that professional development opportunity that you is perhaps unseen and, and undiscovered until you ask that question? Um, and I also, you know, I, I've no time for people who would uh, treat it as a competition and say, oh, look at me, I attended my 15th webinar of the week this week and I've got my certificate, aren't I better than you? That there's, there's no sense of competitiveness in professional development. So I think you know, we need to keep all those considerations in mind, but perhaps the most important one is that innovation without consolidation, without reflective practice accompanying it, um, is innovation for its own sake only. Thank you. Um, another question that came up was, what do you think is the most difficult thing 
uh, when teaching and trying to develop professionally online? Um, I guess you, you've got to be, uh, I think, much more um, dedicated to your own time management. I think you've got to organize your resources uh, much more uh, carefully and in a more considered way than necessarily if you're in a face-to-face -face environment. Very often in face-to-face -face professional development opportunities, it's timetabled, the resources are there for you, um, and you're in a comfortable uh, situation. I think that the distractions that we can face when we're trying to do things online and from home are particularly ones that we need to, to manage in terms of time and also in terms of uh, focus and attention. Um, I think the newness of it all, there's, uh, I guess, the, there's an awful lot that's out there at the minute and, and uh, determining quality, determining that something's worth the investment, if it, it's financial or, or time, um, that's going to be quite challenging to, to navigate and to make sure that your professional development uh, investment is, is actually worth the, the time or money you're going to spend on it. Um, I, thought, I think it's also quite difficult to um, sometimes to find an outlet for that if you are uh, feeling quite isolated and individualized in this current lockdown situation or if you're a freelance teacher who works as an individual anyway trying to find a, a, a space to to share your professional learning with others can be something that's demotivating and a challenge that you need to overcome so there are lots of challenges to it but i'd say there are positives as well thank you um lama was asking um, what would you suggest for networking uh, since people can't actually network at online conferences like they would uh, at face to face conferences? Yeah, um, look, I mean, networks are of varying sizes. You may be lucky enough to have quite a good network, quite a good supportive, collaborative network in the school or institution or university that you work in. And certainly that's the first place to start. Um, but don't forget that there are networks out there <coughs> conducted by volunteers and organized. Um, yeah, if we take the, the organizations like ITAFL and, and uh, TESOL that have their uh, special interest groups that are desperate for volunteers to come and join their uh, committees and are focused on particular areas of interest. But most countries also will have an ITAFL or a TESOL affiliate group that will have a, a members association, another way to develop your network. And then of course, we've seen lots of um, new forms of, of networking rising up, you know, ones that we had prior to the pandemic of uh, kind of ELT chat on, uh, on Twitter and other groups have been supplemented with, with many different types of uh, WhatsApp group and uh, Facebook groups. At Nile, we, we have launched a, um, a Facebook group a group called ELT Open House. So if you're on Facebook, that can be a good place to find a network of uh, nearly a thousand teachers talking about ELT topics. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of opportunities out there and many people in the same boat as you and sharing the same concerns and challenges with brilliant ideas for how to overcome them. So something I'd certainly encourage as part, part of professional development. Thank you. And another question from um, Lamia asking what factors besides networking do you think make online development successful? Um, yeah, good question. I think that um, I'm going to make a pitch for uh, online learning's effectiveness. And I think that there's something that we can overlook very easily in a face-to-face -face classroom. In a face-to-face -face classroom, unless we're very careful and we skillfully manage it, can reward and perhaps over reward the impulsive learners, the ones who are very quick at processing information, who are very ready to uh, produce that information, um, who are you know, really impulsive and, and ready to go with their, their productive skills with very little um, time for deeper processing. We know if, if people are interested in the, the studies on uh, how much wait time um, teachers actually give students in terms of how quickly they uh, expect an answer before moving on with a follow-up question or moving on to another student, that this can be really much less than students need in a face-to-face -face classroom. I would argue that online learning actually gives us the opportunity to really bring in reflexive learners as well. 
the possibility of, of blending asynchronous content and asynchronous activities, whether those are um, self-access or whether they're tutor moderated or whether they're collaborative, blending those with the live online sessions really give us an opportunity for, for deeper processing, for, for working on tasks and for bringing in all those external resources which we don't necessarily have at our fingertips in the physical classroom. Of course, in the real world, if you ask someone to do something, they will bring in all the resources they, they have to do that job effectively. And in the online world, we can have activities where we ask people to go off and um, find out about the best way to, to, to phrase this or to find out collocations that um, belong with this word or to find out different uses of this grammar uh, exponent and, and to really bring in this content. And also, crucially, to have the time to prepare and to proofread their own answers. If we're using asynchronous platforms where people are writing and, and, uh, you, and practicing the productive skill, but also using that as a vehicle for, for demonstrating their learning, then having that time to, um, to edit, to proofread, to check before you put yourself on show in front of others, I think is a, a massive advantage and we shouldn't overlook that opportunity. We've run face-to-face -face and online master's programs at Nile for, um, for the last five years and we're able to compare the quality of work that's produced by people who've studied fully online and people who've studied face to face and people who studied blended and really the comparability is direct equivalence there's no disadvantage to having studied online and in many cases it's an advantage to have that thinking time processing time research time to bring into the um, to the online learning space I absolutely agree, of course. Thank you for that um, answer. I think it also links to another question that we got, which was, should we change our face-to-face -face teaching to take into account uh, the practices of online teaching? Um, should we you know, have to go either back to online teaching or consider a blended approach? Yeah, um, okay, so, so I think it's a, it's a perfect opportunity to re-examine uh, this. I, I've done some webinars recently about uh, assessment in online learning and, and talking about the new opportunities that uh, online gives us to examine our practices and, and to think about what works best. And I think that what online learning um, has enabled us to do is to think about what am I going to keep when things return to physical classrooms? You know, I'm 100% convinced that I want my child uh, who's gone back to school yesterday in the, the UK to continue a face-to-face -face learning experience. There's no way that I would uh, sub, uh, substitute his face-to-face his -face interactions with his teacher and his classmates for fully online. But what is there that we can really grasp hold of that we don't want to lose? I think potentially the idea of the flipped classroom is going to come back and a lot more powerful, a lot stronger. The idea of using asynchronous content to, to engage learners and to engage them with the, um, the, the nuts and bolts of the study or with uh, uh, activating their schematic and then thinking about a topic before coming into the live space, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, is something that's going to have a real re-emergence because it's had so much exposure to such a, a, a wide group now uh, through this forced uh, move to online learning. And I also think we'll probably re-examine what we do with homework after a face-to-face -face or a, a live online session and we'll, we'll think about uh, much more creative ways that we can see homework as a, an opportunity for co collaborative practice and productive use rather than where's my workbook do exercise number 26 on page um, yeah, page 100 I think we'll be much more creative and so it'll be the, the wraparound support to the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching which I think changes rather than necessarily the face-to-face -face practices itself um, uh, with with the caveat that um, you know, everyone will will emerge and engage at different times, and you know, online learning may be a feature for a good time to come for, in some contexts. Thank you. Um, another question is about uh, what do you think is best in terms of um, managing the online teaching when you have to face parents as well. Would you rather um, advise? to really, really engage with them almost on a day-to-day -day basis or just keep absolutely professionally detached? Yes, yeah, a great question. Um, 
look, I guess I'm fortunate, uh, and I'm not avoiding the question, I'll address it. I guess I'm fortunate in that the students I work with are, are teachers. There's not many teachers who come to my online sessions whose parents are standing behind them. I guess it's possible it hasn't happened to me yet. But I know that for many, uh, many teachers, the, the presence of the parents in the online learning space is a real challenge. And uh, I've worked recently with a group of 50 teachers from a school in Chile who said so that's one of the number one concerns that um, your kind of your classroom door is now suddenly open. You don't know who's standing off camera and evaluating the quality of what teaching you're giving to their to their kids, and that's a real threat. Um, my own uh, recommendation and advice would be: you've got to engage with the with the parents. You've got to explain the principles of what you're trying to do. You've got to ask for their understanding of two things: that this is new and a new way of learning for everybody. And that will take some time to get from good enough to good. And number two, that them supplying the answers by whispering them in their child's ear or wanting their child to, to, to have so much support and scaffolding from them that it's actually the parent who's doing the learning rather than the student is counterproductive. Um, easier said than done. I'm well aware of that. And I know that Macmillan's got some, some great uh, webinars from young learner experts who, who um, know far more about this than me. Yeah, and you can find all of them in our archive. Um, another question that came up was, do you think that it's possible to conduct peer observation online? And how would you go on with that, if you think it is possible? Yeah, I mean, um, let's, dis <laughs> let's uh, differentiate between um, management observation which has its quality control, quality assurance purpose. Um, professional development observations, which might be conducted by a, a, a senior, more experienced teacher, but have their focus being supportive and developmental feedback rather than evaluative judgment. And the third category, which is true peer observation, which is uh, non-judgmental, it's supportive, and it's focused. And I think that um, if you can maintain those three aspects of, of peer observation, then it's one of the strongest uh, opportunities for professional development that exists out there. Peer observation, of course, can work two ways. You can get um, a lot of benefit out of being observed, and you can get a lot of benefit out of being the observer. Now, for me, as long as um, you have your students' permission and that you explain to them that there may be somebody else in the room or somebody else watching the recording of the session, then, um, that you've got this fantastic resource for, for enabling peer observation. Not only the fact that if we've recorded this, we can pause it, we can look back at things, we can study what actually happened when things went wrong, we can um, and we can annotate the video. And, and you know, there are loads of great tools. One tool that we talk about on our our free Take Your Teaching Online course is a tool called Edpuzzle. You can upload a video into Edpuzzle, and you can annotate the video at different moment so you could say what you know you could give someone peer feedback on their observation say what were you doing here what were you thinking here do you think this student got that what you were saying um uh, i love the way you did this that was a great um technique to uh, <clears throat> to bring that person in to answer this student's um <clears throat> this student's point so the what we can do with recordings of our peer observation just gives us a whole new set of opportunities and I think that can be done as effectively online as face-to-face <clears throat> uh, -face and perhaps more so but bearing in mind that true peer observation needs to be non-judgmental and supportive um, rather than uh, an opportunity to to pick holes in somebody else's practice. I think that's a really great tip. Um, another question is pinned up at the top of the chat box from Jack Deep asking how does professional development for teachers look at learner autonomy? <clears throat> yeah, great. I'm just going to answer very quickly. Uh, yes, it was Ed Puzzle that those people who are typing ED Puzzle in the uh, in the chat box, you're absolutely right. Just, just um, search for that in your preferred search engine and you will um, find this free tool. Okay. Um, professional development focus on learner autonomy. Well, uh, Learner autonomy is certainly an aspect that um, is, is a, a crucial part of learner training and moving to online, particularly if we're going to effectively blend asynchronous and live 
online teaching, then we're dependent on some aspect of learner autonomy. Um, we're having to give a lot of responsibility over to the learners and we're having to ask a lot from them in terms of uh, patience and commitment and um, uh, maintaining their motivation in the face of things that may go wrong as we, we, we find our way through a, a new skill set. Um, I think that that would be a, an ideal focus for a professional development activity. And if you go back to um, the slide, or I should say, if you go back, if I go back to the slide here with uh, uh, 12 different aspects of, or opportunities which we could take for professional development, you can pretty much see how a focus on learner autonomy would fit into many of these. It might be that you read particularly or look for particular articles on developing learner autonomy and reflect on those principles for your own classroom. It may be that you ask someone to observe your class with a particular focus on how autonomously uh, learners are able to work. Uh, it may be that you um, prepare and deliver an inset activity on developing learner autonomy for your colleagues. You, you see what I mean? There, there are all different ways to approach the aspect of learner autonomy through professional development activities, some will be more suitable for people than others. We've talked a lot about the individualized nature of professional development and we don't all have the same learning preferences and our learning preferences aren't um, fixed through our career. We may at some point just love the passiveness of, of listening to a webinar and thinking uh, about it for a couple of days afterwards. Other times we think, do you know what? this time I really want to get stuck in there and I want to read something and try it out and reflect on it straight away. Um, yeah, there, there's no right or wrong of that. It's the, um, the reflection and the consolidation of the practice, which I think makes it effective development. Thank you so, so much, Tom. Um, we'll let you go now because Tom also delivered a session this morning. But as you can see from the feedback that we're already getting in the chat box, People are absolutely inspired and some even said persuaded by your answers. So thank you so much for a great session and some great answers as well. I think thank you. you want I just want to, yeah. to introduce uh, a couple of pages that people might be interested in. Uh, you've already talked about our courses, which is great. But I also want to tell you about the Nile membership page, which is completely free. Uh, loads of activities, ideas, tools from Nile that you can sign up for and get access to, whether that's tools for using the CEFR, tools for analyzing your texts, uh, podcasts, webinar recordings, teaching activities, teacher training activities, a whole glossary of thousands of words in our profession and what they mean and how to use them and further reading. There's a great um, re free resource there for you uh, when you've got time to, to explore, uh, as well as all the, the Nile courses um, that we're running this summer as well. Thanks for, for that, uh, Federico. So do and go, uh, do go and check the Nile uh, webpage and also follow them on Facebook and Twitter for updates about courses and anything that's coming up this summer. Uh, you can find all of the information there on screen. And I'm also going to show you um, the slide about our uh, discount that we're offering you for the summer courses that Tom just mentioned. They're all online. So wherever you are in the world, you will be able to attend them and meet some teachers and trainers from all over the world. I think that's just great. And if you use MM2020, you will also get a 15% discount. Do check the terms and conditions on the website. Thank you so much, Tom, for a great session. Thank you, Federico. I've forgotten, I forgot to mention yeah. one other thing as well. Um, as uh, this is the last in the current season of Macmillan webinars, and you may be wondering what's uh, what to do with yourselves next, if you can't take a course, then um, Niall will be running a series of panel discussions with some of our specialist trainers in different topic areas, assessment, management, teacher training, young learners, CLIL, uh, over the summer, and they'll be free to attend. So please keep your eye on Niall's Twitter and Facebook pages for details of that um, series of live online panel discussions coming up in July and August. Absolutely. I've heard some names coming up earlier and they're absolutely great. Um, do attend them, guys, if you can. They're absolutely great. So thank you so much, Tom, for a great session. And thanks, everyone, for great questions, great attendance. Uh, this was our last webinar of the season. So before we go on with some housekeeping, I just want to get 
Mike, who's in the room with us uh, here. Uh, I, th I think he, he wants to say a few words to thank you all because you've been a great, great audience. And it's been a real pleasure for me to host these webinars and co-host them um, in the past few months. I think it's been such a great uh, thing that we could still join um, during these crazy times that we're living in. The internet has allowed us to still come together. Uh, I can see that Mike is coming on. I don't know if you can hear him yet. Can you hear Mike? So not yet. But um, Mike is coming on. I can see the icon. So, there you go. I think we can hear you now. Federico, some yeah. requests for you to go back to the one stop page on your slides. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. So thanks, Mike. Guys, just let so, me tell you that. Yeah. Can you can you I, hear me, Federica? Yes, we can hear yeah. you loud and clear. Okay, no, yes. just um uh, it's one of the problems when we've got so many teachers online that it takes a while um, to log in. But um, so for those of you who don't know, my name's Mike. I'm the teacher training manager here. And um, together with uh, Federica, uh, we've put together this webinar series. So just firstly, a huge thank you to Tom for the great session um, today. And just uh, for me personally, this is going to be my last Macmillan uh, webinar because this week is my last week working for Macmillan Education. So um, over the years, we've had thousands of teachers join us for these sessions. So I just wanted to thank you personally. Um, during this particular lockdown period, we've had over 100,000 um, teachers join us for our webinars and and um, I can't thank you enough. We know how busy you are. We know that as well as teaching, many of you have got um, children and families to look after as well. So the fact that you uh, give us an hour of your time is, is a, a great honor. So uh, this is my last chance to thank you all personally. And of course, my biggest thank you goes to the star of our webinar series, which is, uh, of course, Federica. Um, Federica does so much work behind the scenes to get these going and she does such a brilliant job of hosting that i don't have to do it anymore and it's that's great and uh, of course uh, some of you may have seen that during some of our sessions we've had technical problems and federica has had to keep things going for 5 10 15 sometimes even 20 minutes so um she's done an, an amazing job so um thanks to everybody and uh, i'll definitely be joining in to uh, the uh, insight sessions that the, the panel discussions that Tom was talking about. So uh, look forward to seeing many of you there. Thanks, guys.